The way that I got into Behind the Green Door was um, I was a little hippie chick living in San Francisco. And this was about, let's see, 1970, probably the end of 1970. I can't really remember the years. You know, it's kind of foggy. But um, <clears throat> I moved to San Francisco thinking it was the entertainment capital of the world because uh, I had lived in previously in New York City. And the first film that I was ever in was The Owl and the Pussycat with Barbara Streisand and George Siegel. And I had a, a very small part in it. But um, it was enough to get my Screen Actors Guild card. And, you know, I felt I was kind of on my way to stardom. So everybody wants to come out to Los Angeles to, to be in films. And I had come out to L.A. for one brief, uh, for a brief time, actually it was a promotional tour for The Owl and the Pussycat. I guess Barbara didn't want to go. <laughs> so they sent myself and Roz Kelly. And I just absolutely hated L.A. I thought, oh, God, how can anybody live here? And the next stop was San Francisco, which in those days it was drug, sex, and rock and roll and hippie stuff. And so we went up to San Francisco and it was really, it was my kind of place, my kind of town. And, uh, immediately went back to New York, packed my things, drove out across the country and moved to San Francisco. And so uh, in the meantime, while I was trying to find work as an actress, which as you know, San Francisco is not exactly too great for that, I was working in odd jobs. I was a hostess in a health food restaurant. I was a topless bottomless dancer. <laughs> Sorry, Mom. She didn't know about that one. <laughs> I worked for a dentist, I think. I did a lot of different odd jobs. And I always looked at the newspaper every day to try to see if I could find something. And one day I was reading the San Francisco Chronicle and it said, now casting for a major motion picture. Well, I thought, well, that's totally cool. And um, so the, they gave the phone number and they gave the address. And so I called up and they said, oh, no, 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 we're finished casting, so don't bother. And I said, oh, no, you've got to wait. And I remember the gal that answered the phone, was her name was Lori. And um, she was pretty much around the whole time during the Mitchell Brothers era. Anyway, um, she answered the phone and I begged her, I begged her to wait because I really wanted to come down and try out for this. Had absolutely no idea what it was and um, finally found stage A on Tennessee Street, which was very difficult to find and walked into this stage and there was all these people sitting there making out uh, their little forms, you know, of will you do this, will you do that, and how tall are you, and the whole bit. And so I started, and I remember it was a green form, how appropriate, <laughs> and I started filling it out, and I got down to this one part and said, do you want a, actually what it said was, do you want a balling or a non-balling role? And I thought, this is a uh, typo here. <laughs> I thought that they said, do you want a bowling or a non-bowling role? And I mean, I can bowl fairly, fairly well, and um, so I said, well, sure, you know, no problem. And when I was done, I, you know, I went over and kind of, I kind of was looking around me and it was just, I kind of had weird vibes that it was <laughs> really not exactly what I thought it was going to be. And I knew that San Francisco was a pretty innovative town and they were doing all kinds of strange things. And strange didn't bother me. But um, a sex film definitely would have just put me right out the door. Uh, I didn't, topless was okay, but um, for some reason I did, I started to get the impression that this was a little bit more than <laughs> just an R-rated type of a thing. And I just said, well, you know, forget it, I'm, I'm not interested. And I had my little modeling portfolio with me. And as, as I was on my way out the door, I looked up and um, Jim Mitchell and Art Mitchell were standing up uh, at the stage. There's a stairway that goes up and their offices were upstairs. And... Um, as I was walking out, they said, wait, 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 don't go anywhere. And I looked up and I thought, well, who are these guys? They didn't seem like they'd be involved in something this, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? I, you know, uh, this naughty. And so they said, well, come on upstairs, come on upstairs. And here were these two brothers. One of them had a sweater vest on, I think, with a tie and a Brooks Brothers shirt you know, really preppy looking. And I thought, well, this is pretty corny. <laughs> the kind of guys that you would think that would be doing these types of films are um, smoking a big cigar, bald head with their feet up on the desk. You know, come on in, honey. And it just wasn't like that. There were two brothers who were really nice and really 
all American looking, and they sat me down and proceeded to tell me the story of Behind the Green Door, which for that time was pretty risque, and um, <clears throat> but pretty much different than anyone else had ever done because no one had done a story, a story in a, in a erotic film. They're all stag films and eight millimeters and they didn't have a story. And I was pretty fascinated by the fantasies that they were telling me and <clears throat> the way that this, they got a hold of the, this, this story was, I, can't, I don't know if it was the Korean War or what, but in the trenches the guys would pass around these, this paper <clears throat> and each guy would put down, would add on to the fantasy. Um, it's a fantasy of a woman that go, that's kidnapped or taken against her will, I should say, and taken to this very exotic, erotic, elite sex club and loved as she's never been loved before. And um, so I thought that was pretty, pretty amazing. And these guys would just continue on with the story with the writing, writing down their fantasies. So that's how it came about. And, you know, I told them, well, I might be interested, but, you know, is there sex? I said, oh, yeah, there's, this is definitely sex. And I thought, Ugh. well, maybe I could do that. I don't know. But not really imagining that I could. And I said to them, well, here's the price. I gave them a price off the top of my head. And I told them I wanted a certain percentage of the gross. I don't know where I'd read that someplace. And um, they said, well, you, you know, don't call us. We'll call you. And that was the end of it. So I left. And I thought, oh, phew out of that one and I went back to my little pad over on Potrero Hill and um, about an hour later I got a phone call and it was I believe it was Jim and he says listen we've decided to to meet with your terms and we'll come on over and we can sign the contract well it was just kind of what and then you know before I knew it they were knocking on my door with a contract in their hand with all the things that I had asked for and so really they called my bluff and I thought, well, you know, I really kind of rationalized it, <laughs> that I could use this as a stepping stone in my career because <clears throat> nobody really knew. The pendulum was beginning to swing forward, and really nobody knew how far it was going to go before it would go backwards. And I kind of felt, because, you know, last tango in Paris, I'm not sure exactly when that came up, but that, the hype was there, and it was... The sex part was was um, beginning to appear in the sexiness was beginning to appear in a lot of films. So I felt that if I could do the make this the best and sexiest film ever, then you know maybe it would help my career. Hmm. One of the things that definitely was added to the whole hoopla <clears throat> was something that I had forgotten to tell Jim and Art, and that was one day I I was thinking about it and I said you know. I forgot to tell you this. I, you know, I used to be a model in New York. And, you know, when I was 17, I shot a, a soapbox for Ivory Soap. <laughs> and they said, well, yeah, go on. And I said, I was the mom on the box holding the baby. <laughs> and they said, oh, really? Well, when is this supposed to come out in the shelves? I said, you know, I, I think it's, they said it was going to take about two years to take the old picture off the box and the new picture on the box, which would be mine. And I think it should be coming out just about now. <laughs> and they were like, they were freaking out. I mean, they, they were, we were, we went to the supermarket, I believe, and walked down the soap aisles and looked up and there it was. And it had just come out that week, the very same week that Behind the Green Door was just about ready to come out. So it was a PR man's dream, basically. And they, ju they just picked up the phone and started calling everyone they could think of. Because the controversy of the two was, was certainly worth the print <laughs> that it got. And it was definitely helped the film. When I did look at the script, uh, I didn't have any lines. I said, uh, hello. <laughs> you know, I'm an actress here. And they said, oh, well, this is going to be a lot more difficult because you're not going to say it one word during the whole film. I was like, oh, okay. And um, they were right. It's way more difficult to not, you know, of course, as soon as you open your mouth, what do they say? The, the more you talk, the dumber you sound, you know? So, um, so I, this was going to be a very big challenge to me. I mean, I had gone to acting school, but I, I, I wasn't sure if anything I learned there was going to be coming in handy here. But, you know, back then when they were shooting um, this film, 
And looking at it today, it's really not from a gynecologist's point of view. Like the films that are made today, it's very, you know, the insertion shots and all that stuff's real heavy. Back then it was a lot more of from the waist up, from the neck up. They were shooting a lot of like full face on screen, like large facial shots. Um, so you really had to be careful. I learned a lot about making films and you really have to be careful about, I have a lot of very uh, large expressions that I can make that you have to really be careful when it's filling up the whole screen, your face, you have to really tone it way down. And um, it was a challenge for sure. And I felt that uh, if somebody could understand what was going on in my head, through my eyes, you know, then they would, it, it would give them an idea of, of what Gloria was going through because I was going through the same thing, tell you the truth, because they didn't really want me to know what was going to happen. So the Mitchell brothers were the kidnappers. I don't know if you knew that in the film. They were the, they were the guys that kidnapped me. So I know that they got off on that one. And they were rough. You know, they, they threw me in the car and blindfolded me, and it was, it was really kind of cool because it was just, it was really, uh, um, you really felt like you were, going through this thing. I really put myself in the position of Gloria. And um, then when she walked out from behind the green door, I really didn't know what to expect, to tell you the truth. So it was scary. And on the other hand, it was really exciting, you know, which is sometimes what sex should be. And, um, and especially with Johnny Keys, I was, I was frightened, I'll tell you. Because <laughs> when I saw him walk out, I thought, oh my gosh. And it's not like I hadn't met anybody before, but here was acting, <laughs> but really when you do a sex film, it's kind of like a documentary because it's really happening. It's not something that you can fake. It's something, you know, when you're really having sex, you're really having sex and the feelings, the emotions that are coming over you are really what's happening to you. It's kind of hard to, to act that. So when Johnny Keys did his thing, I'll never forget, there was a moment of, uh, of kind of a primitive, thing when we both looked in each other's eyes and something just clicked and it was that's when I just kind of let loose and got into it as as Gloria would have because I wasn't going to be able to leave there so I might as well enjoy myself and um, from then on I really got into it and I but I remember that one moment on screen when that happened and um, and I think as a when the viewers when as a, as a viewer you can see that and the thing that made the film special was, you know, it was, it was about this woman and you were trying to, I think you were being, you were able to feel the kinds of feelings that she was feeling. And um, when it turned into the really hot sexual thing, that's when like, the film took off. But it was, it was really fun. Political uh, passion at that moment in, in the whole country was uh, staunchly against pornography. And unfortunately, that today, that's not happening. So a lot of the film, there's no controversy anymore. And so, needless to say, back then, there was a lot of people on a soapbox uh, professing that, you know, porno was just, you know, horrible, horrible, horrible thing, and which was great for business, you know. But Diane Feinstein, um, in the city of brotherly love in San Francisco, uh, probably the loosest place in the world, and still is, one of my favorite cities. Um, here she was, totally anti-porn, which really pissed the Mitchell brothers off, but again, it brought them a lot of publicity, a lot of ink, a lot of radio and television, and that's what they needed for promotion. I mean, you couldn't buy that kind of publicity. And I think that after one, I know that after one time uh, that she really came down hard on them, they put her home phone number up on the marquee. <laughs> so in the middle of the night, she was getting all kinds of obscene phone calls. And I think that she had to have a pretty good sense of humor because <laughs> she kind of took it all in stride. And of course that got more publicity. Um, and I was busted up there a couple of times for, I mean, it's the whole thing of if you don't want to go in there then you don't need to pay the money and you don't need to watch the shows. If you do want to go in there then why should you be hassled? I mean they, they yanked guys out of there the night I was busted and drug them down to jail and it was pretty, it's pretty ridiculous. And I think that the people in San Francisco really became irate about this, that, it, that needlessly spending taxpayers' money on, you know, there must have been 50 cops there.
And when they took me down to the police station and put me in a cell, um, it was actually a holding cell. And I remember I had, I don't think I had anything on under my fur, I had a fur coat on, sorry. <laughs> And I had nothing on underneath it. They just like yanked me out of there. They thought it was really funny. But they were really nice to me, you know. And one by one, they all came in there and had their Polaroid taken with me. <laughs> and I signed them all. And it was very, uh, you know, they were all really polite and, you know, oh, hi, Mr. Bird. You know, I finally got out, got bailed out. But the next day, the shows were, it was sold out for a week. 